Returning to this diagram, we also see that there is a magnetic moment, mu, that's associated with the fact that the electron is charged. And if we think of a distribution of that charge across, say, a spherical shape, then if it's spinning about its axis, then we again have these sort of loops of current and that's creating this magnetic moment. And there's, unlike the orbital case, there's no simple derivation of what the exact value of mu spin should be, but we'll see that it looks very similar to the orbital case. So if we now look at mu that's from the spin, in the z direction, that is a negative ms, where that's the quantum number, times g, which is a constant, and that's times mu b, which is that Bohr magneton. So what we're saying is that it is very similar to the orbital case, and the only difference is this g term, where gs is roughly equal to 2. Okay, so this is now showing us that we can, again, if you now think about a magnetic field that would be applied, this cre could create the potential energy. And once again, we're going to look for this in measurements. So this measurement was done in 1921 by Stern and Gerlach. And the diagram is shown on the bottom where they realized that if you had, if you created a magnetic field that changed along the Z axis, so it had a Z dependence, then this would create a force and we can write out that force. And again, this should hopefully look familiar from electromagnetism, where we have a force along the z direction, which is the derivative of the potential energy in that direction, in the z direction. And we can just plug in uh, what we had here, where again, remember that we're multiplying mu times b, and mu, uh, the Bohr magneton is a constant, g is a constant, so those come out, so we just get minus, uh, and I'm going to call this a subscript j, you'll see what that means in a second, times mu b, and then this is now the derivative of b with respect to z. So this is what we're saying here by the magnetic, uh, you could think of the rate of change of the magnetic field along the z direction. And so this is now creating a force. Now, I was going to say what is g subscript j and that includes that you can have both the orbital and the spin effect so in other words you've got the quantum numbers from the orbital angular momentum and from the spin angular momentum combined so it's sort of hiding some of the details but what we see in a simplified case where we have that uh, if you are in the little l equals 1, uh, you had the three possible values of ml, the quantum number, which was minus 1, 0, or 1. And here we're assuming that uh, in this case, this is a much stronger effect than you would get from spin. And these uh, little 
particles are shown in the diagram with the direction of their magnetic moment depending on the that quantum number and you can see that if m is equal to zero then the uh, potential energy due to that magnetic moment is zero and so there's no force that's applied either up or down and that uh, let's first think about these as hydrogen. Actually, the atoms that Stern and Gerlach used were neutral silver, and that had a fortunate uh, benefit that it acted exactly as hydrogen does. So later on uh, in 1927, Phipps and Taylor uh, used ground state hydrogen atoms. But here we're, we're looking at the same thing. So in other words, uh, without that added potential energy, which then uh, didn't give any uh, force, that um, m equals 0 just continues straight. However, the m minus 1 and m plus 1 do deviate. There is a force that's applied. And so we're now splitting apart this beam and we're seeing on the screen that pattern that's shown there in the middle where you had those atoms that went through undeflected and you had the atoms deflected up and those deflected down. Now an interesting case um, is, when, is when you are in the ground state and in this ground state um, I should say that L is not equal to 1. L is equal to 0 in the ground state. And so that means that the uh, there is no effect due to the orbital uh, quantum numbers. And you only have the plus or minus 1 half m quantum number from the spin. So in that case, if this quantum number did not exist, you would expect no deflection at all. And you would just see a line, a horizontal line. In fact, what they measured is what's shown on the right, where this splitting of the plus and minus due to the spin quantum number is what gave you that measured pattern where it either went up or down depending on its spin quantum number of plus one half or minus one half. And again, that was for either this neutral silver in the ground state or ground state hydrogen atoms. And this then provided strong evidence that you need this spin quantum number.